Not too long ago, the public defeated a proposed coal-fired power plant in Marshalltown. Alliant Energy is now back with a gas-fired power plant proposal, and that has the community divided. We'll talk with Nathaniel Baer about that. We'll also talk with uh, Tim Cruzy with uh, Green... Uh, there we go. I knew I'd forget the name. About solar power, and then we'll also talk with uh, Barry Engerbretson about primary health care. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Najee's Mediterranean Grocery Store is a new business in the Drake neighborhood of Des Moines. Featuring Middle Eastern products, Najee's offers a wide range of specialty foods at competitive prices, including hummus, falafel, tahini, pita bread, baklava, kosher, vegetarian foods, and Ethiopian and Jera bread. If you want to add unique ethnic flavors to your cooking, Najee's is the store for you. It's at 1133 42nd Street in Des Moines, just south of University Avenue. Stop by or call 255-3736 for more information. That's Najee's Mediterranean Grocery, 255-3736. This is Dr. Holding, the Story County Veterinary Clinic. For 15 years, we have been spaying and neutering feral cat groups at affordable prices. Wild cats destroy game birds and songbirds. A single female cat can produce over 4,000 kittens in seven years. The shelters are full, so unwanted kittens will be put to sleep. Your cats will stay home and stay healthy. Call us for all your dog and cat needs at the Story County Veterinary Clinic between Ames and Nevada on Highway 30, one mile east of Interstate 35, 515-232-8766. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Hello, folks. Uh, welcome to the uh, Fallon Forum today. Thank you, uh, Brother Trucker, for bringing us on here. Uh, okay, so... um. Every 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 day or two I say this, it just just keeps getting worse for Leonard Boswell. Again, you, no secret, I'm not going to support the guy, and I think actually uh, we we uh, we we do um, we do politics a favor by uh, having Latham as a target next time around. Maybe somebody who is more progressive can uh, take him on. But uh, Boswell only had 30 people show up at the uh, at the, his speech at the uh, state fair. That's uh, the only other person lower than that was a Socialist Workers Party candidate. He had two. Boswell had 30. Um, and this was the kind of endorsement. The reaction was, quote, an older woman said she would vote for Boswell, but doubted he would win. Boswell did not take questions. Ouch. Anyway, folks, um, yeah, that and the fact that he's being outspent 6-1 to one by his opponent, Tom Latham, not a good situation for Leonard. Um, with me in the studio here is uh, Nathaniel Bear, And Nathaniel, you are with? The Iowa Environmental Council. Right. Yes. And uh, recently it was uh, discovered that Alliant Energy wants to build a, a, a gas-fired power plant in Marshalltown. And you were among the many citizen groups and, and, and citizens who were opposed to a coal-fired power plant, which we mm -hmm. defeated. Which Alliant canceled. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so, you know, the coal plant they proposed in the same location in Marshall, just outside of Marshalltown uh, in uh, 2007, they eventually canceled that plant now. And at the time, they said, we'll be back. We'll have a new proposal. And now they're back with a uh, gas-fired power plant, really about the same size plant. Um, the, the fundamental difference is that it's fueled by natural gas, uh, and it has some potential upsides compared to a coal-fired power plant. Potential upsides. Now, again, uh, the... Um there, there's no doubt that coal is probably the uh, dirtiest form of uh, non-renewable renewable fuel out there. Mm -hmm. But is gas that much better? When you think about fracking, when you think about the uh, the water contamination, the uh, the methane releases, uh, the um, the fact that you've got billions and billions of gallons of brine going into the uh, into the into the into the earth every every day. Uh, I mean, are these things? And now, now the uh, study out today, just today, saying that it uh, looks like. Uh, there may be a connection between fracking and earthquakes. Uh, yes, yeah, so natural gas may have a, a lower carbon footprint than coal, but is it really anything re close to resembling environmentally friendly? And should we be uh, quickly pursuing a new coal, a new a new gas-fired power plant at a time when we don't really even have the answers to these questions? Right, right. So there's a few things about gas to keep in mind, and, and one is you know Alliant has. Um, only released very high level information. So we have a lot more that we need to learn about the proposal. And it's also worth noting that the, the gas plant is part of a total proposal that involves some other components that, that so we can yeah, talk what about. What else is involved? Uh, renewing a contract to buy nuclear power from Iowa's only nuclear power plant. 
and continuing their commitment to efficiency and renewables without a lot of detail there, and then upgrading some existing old So, I mean, I mean buying more, uh, more nuclear power from the Palo plant. Right, Palo Which plant. is already 40 years old. Right. Which is the same design as the Fukushima plant. Correct. Which seems like a bad idea to me. Right. So that's why, yeah, there's, okay. there's a whole proposal here. We need to <laughs> keep all of it in mind. On the gas plant part, you know, gas plays well in the sandbox, potentially, with wind and solar in a way that coal and nuclear plants can't do. Uh, gas plants can, depending on the design, come up quickly and go down quickly. So as wind and solar come on systems and go off systems, well, why is the that? gas plant can fill those gaps. Why is that? Uh, just the plant design, the way it works, it can be brought online quickly and brought offline quickly. And wind and solar, they're known as intermittent resources. So on a utility system, they might blow. You know, the wind might blow. There's a lot of wind energy, but that could disappear over a period of hours. And as it gradually disappears a gas plant can fill that but it's need. But it's a storage problem. I mean, we're, we're learning how to do a better job at storing right. solar and wind power. We have the gas technology, you know, that we can put in today uh, at a scale maybe that we don't have for, for storage today. And so, mm. um, you know, it's, it's only part of the answer. It's not, you know, going to do everything for us. But the, one of the upsides to a gas plant is it could help bring on significantly more wind and solar mm. in a way that no other type of power plant that Alliant would propose, a nuclear or a coal plant, could, could do that. Folks, uh, Nathaniel Bear with the Iowa Environmental Council is with us, with, with us for the first segment of the show today. We're talking about the proposed uh, gas-fired power plant in Marshalltown. If you'd like to join the conversation, 244-0077 or toll-free, it's 855-244-0077. Uh, so, again, what do you say to, I mean, again, it seems to me the, the environmental community is somewhat divided on this. Some see it as the, the lesser of two evils, or lesser of maybe three evils, mm -hmm. or four, depending on what you want to count. Uh, I mean, is that kind of where you're coming from, that among the non-renewables it's less objectionable? But again, if so, how do you address the concerns that people raise about fracking and earthquakes and water pollution? Right. So, you know, I think the, our view on the gas plant is if the priority, if our priority is to get as much wind and solar on the system in Iowa as possible, and in the region and nationally, uh, you know, what other pieces of the puzzle do we need? And uh, a gas plant is at least a potential piece of that puzzle. Uh, again, a lot of information remains to be seen. But, um, but, but why, why, do you, why do we even need to go? If, if the goal is solar, wind, uh, energy efficiency, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, biomass, um, all the other renewable options, if, if that's the goal, then, 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 again, we're not moving as, as fast toward that goal as we need to. I mean, certainly we see other parts of the world where the people are moving more quickly in that direction. Although, you know, in Iowa, we've made tremendous progress. Sure. And we're talking about wind. a power plant in Iowa. Yeah. And, you know, with wind, we're going to be close to 25% of our generation. It's already uh, 20% at the end of the year. Yeah. Uh, and that's more from Mid American than from Alliant. And, right, right. That is more from Mid American than Alliant. There's also a lot of independent producers. Right. And uh, so looking at Iowa, kind of what makes sense in Iowa, the advantage of certain gas plant designs is it could work very well not just with the wind we have today, but say doubling, tripling, and quadrupling the wind we have today so that we're supplying uh, so, you know, the region, the nation with clean energy. Explain to me again how the, how you, what you see as the gas-wind connection uh, or beyond-wind gas-renewable connection. Right. So there are, and again, there are plant designs that are designed to come online very quickly so that the power plant could be producing 200 megawatts, then 300, then 400 within the period of an hour, maybe even 30 minutes. Uh, so if wind is coming offline, the wind is dropping, the gas plant can fill that. Conversely, those power plants can also reduce their output very quickly. Okay, but, but here, why, why not focus on, 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 on developing mm -hmm. strategies for restoring energy produced by wind turbines, by solar generators? And, and uh, I'm not saying we shouldn't be doing that, you know. We, okay. we should be doing that too. You know, all, all we're saying is there is a potential upside with a gas plant because it could help with significantly more wind in Iowa but now yeah, I'm, I'm and not, solar I, down the road. I'm not seeing the connect. I understand what you're saying about it. It can, it can, it can be ramped up quickly and brought down quickly. I understand that. I'm, but I don't, I, I don't understand the connection to wind and solar. That's the connection. Because wind and solar come on and off quickly. But again... So you need other things on the, on, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the mix that can, that can be flexible and go up and down quickly so that... Uh, you know, there's a, a constant okay. amount of power being supplied but, to people who use it. But to my point about storage, I mean, right. we're, are, right. are we, are we, we've already come a, a ways on that, but it seems like, it almost seems like the uh, powers that be are hesitant to engage too broadly in solar development or in storage, in storage systems for solar and wind. 
um, because it would it would eliminate that argument right there. Well, and, and I guess you know you know uh, the the storage. I, I don't know, and, and you know I might be speaking a little outside of my comfort zone. I don't know that we have the technology commercialized today in operation to to do at the cost what this gas plant could do to help wind and solar integrate. Uh, you know there have been storage projects piloted around the country. There's been a, an attempt in Iowa. Uh, so far, it hasn't worked at the cost and, and commercialization level that, that we would need. And so, you know, this technology is there. Mm -hmm. It is available. It is commercial. Yeah. And now, now, there are, I, I know that with, with coal-fired power plants, with nuclear power plants, as with solar and wind, there is downtime. Solar and wind, the downtime tends to be short-term, a day or two, you know, a few days of uh, cloudiness or something. Who knows? Uh, with a nuclear power plant, I mean, is Fort Calhoun still down? I, I believe that's it is. been what yeah. almost two years now. Uh, yeah, year and a half. Yeah, yeah. And that's that's due to the uh, flooding on the Missouri River. In, in large part, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there are coal-fired power plants right. that go down for a long time, right? Uh, for one reason or another. So I, I I get tired of those who argue that well, you know, we we we've got to have a reliable base load, right? You know, something that's not gonna not gonna um you know cut out on us. But mm -hmm. I mean, everything will cut out for one reason or another. And it seems like with solar and wind, I mean, of course, you can always have malfunctions in equipment there, but well, you've never, I've never seen a situation where they're down for you know, a year and a half, two years. The important thing with solar and wind is to have the resource distributed in a broad geographic area. So, for example, you don't put all the wind turbines in one county in Iowa. You distribute it across the state, across the region, Ideally, knowing yeah. that it will be windy somewhere in the Midwest pretty much every hour of the year. Hmm. It might not always be windy in Iowa, but we could always get wind from other places. Yeah. Um, that being said, you know, uh, in, in the near term, I think before we get to that point where we have a sufficient amount of wind and solar spread uh, yeah. across the, the region, the country, um, uh, having some gas in the system. Like the, and you have to realize, too, we have almost no gas. I've never been today. a fan of having gas in the system, but anyway. Uh. <laughs> Especially in this small studio. <laughs> That's right. Uh, well, speaking of gas uh, and hot air, uh, I, I see Frank is on the, on the phone here for us. Uh, folks, um, if you get tired of hearing Frank from Des Moines call, then you should call 244-0077. And I'll say this to... Uh, I'll say this, Frank. I will. I will always prioritize new callers. But if nobody else wants to call in, and you want to call in and pick on my guest, okay, we'll have it that way. Frank, what's up? Well, I may not pick on your guest. Okay. He sounds like he's got a monicum of sanity. Then what's he doing on my show? <laughs> I don't know, but I mean, he, you know, actually, uh, you know, he's he's pretty wise. He's he's saying that natural gas ought to be part of the strategy. Some people won't even go that far. Uh, a couple of things I wanted to, uh, to ask. Uh, I've heard you reference this on your show a couple of times about this Palo nuclear plant. How many tsunamis do you expect to hit that in the near uh, future? Oh, I, I don't think tsunamis are the issue with Palo. I think, uh, I think um, uh, flooding might be, a tornado might be. I think the fact that it's 40 years old. Well, okay, but uh, uh, Fukushima probably wouldn't have had any issues had it not get hit by a tsunami, right? Um, I'm not sure that's true. I, 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 you know, you could, I mean, thir certainly Three Mile Island had different issues. Chernobyl had different issues. But, but the, um, I, I mean, you know, it, it's hard. Part of the challenge here is figuring out what is the, um, what is the, uh, the least objectionable option. And I think uh, Nathaniel and I agree that a natural gas plant is probably better than coal. But, but I, and I, I look at all the other. Uh, new concerns that are being raised, and I think why why rush ahead? I mean, I don't know what the time frame is on the Alliant Energy coal plant proposed for Marshalltown. Uh, I don't know how fast track that is, but it seems to me like we ought to slow down and wait. I mean, just today, more evidence uh, of concern about the production, the extraction rather, of uh, natural gas. Well, I have an all of the above opinion. I think uh, you you ought to use all the tools in your arsenal. Uh, but I had a question for either of you, if either of you know. On, a, on, on my recent trip uh, back across western Iowa, I, I, I saw hundreds to probably thousands of uh, wind turbines. It's a beautiful thing, isn't it? Oh, yeah, it was just uh, aesthetically beautiful. Not. Uh, but uh, I think it is, but go ahead. 85% of those turbines weren't turning. Can, can either of you give me an explanation as to why? It, it, probably two things. I mean, it, was it a windy day? It, 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 
Well, I mean, I, I'm, and when I was riding in the car, it appeared to be windy, but, you know, yeah. I wasn't standing outside, uh, you know, gauging the, the, the speed of the wind, but when you're motoring along at 70 mile an hour, it appeared to be windy. I mean, if it's a windy day and you see a, a, a wind farm uh, where the turbines aren't spinning, typically it's because there's a transmission constraint. It's, it's too uh, windy, in it, other words. It's, well, it's, it, and there's, it's potentially too windy or um, other power plants are running. And there's just not the, – the transmission lines would get stressed if those turbines put energy onto the grid. And so they're actually turned off manually. Oh, okay. Um, uh, well, well, it might be automatic, but the choice is made to turn them off to prevent uh, problems on the grid. Well, I've also noticed this uh, over around the Mitsubishi plant around Carlock, Illinois, that uh, a lot of the turbines over there aren't turning either. And, and I haven't been to that part of the state. I've been to western Iowa, so I'm, I'm much more familiar with – with the circumstances there. I think there's probably a good reason, and I think that could be it, Frank. Uh, well, I mean, you I, know, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm a novice at it, so I guess I'm... And, and Frank, actually, your, your uh, observation sort of reinforces my, what I was talking about earlier. You know, one of the problems we have is all the coal and nuclear plants on the system can't back down, so the wind turbines are forced to back down. Well, well that's, that's what I've heard some, um, some obviously intelligent people talk about on it, that... Uh, you know, it depends on what's online and what's not online. And, and, and wind is the easiest thing, I guess you're saying, to shut down or knock off. Well, and it's part of the problem. We don't have the transmission capacity for it. Mm-hmm. I mean, if all those turbines were turning at full force, uh, that would be a, a stress to the uh, transmission system, correct? Yeah, so we, we do need more transmission lines. That's, that's definitely true. But, again, it reinforces the point that the bulk of the power we have on the system, the nuclear and the coal, isn't flexible. And so... What suffers is what is, you know, is the, the stuff that is flexible, and right now that's wind. Well, um, let me ask your guest this also uh, quickly. Uh, are, are you totally against coal altogether, or are you for the technology where uh, supposedly if they spend enough money, the technology is out there to have clean coal burning? I think the operative word there, Frank, is supposedly. Well, no, uh, the technology is there. It costs a fortune. Well, no, the technology it's, is there to store this uh, carbon emission underground, the way I understand. That worries me even more than pumping all this brine <laughs> into the ground to uh, release natural gas. I, I, I think you mess with that stuff, and you're going to cause trouble. Yeah. And, again, it's only one issue, too. Boy, is your guest totally against coal altogether? Well, let's or? find out. <laughs> yeah, no, we see coal as, as really a non-starter. Uh, there just isn't a, a way to do coal um, without... Well, you know, first, it's not renewable. We have a limited supply. And second, it's, uh, there's really no way to do it with, uh, you know, in an environmentally responsible way. Now, you're not totally against nuclear, I, 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 I glean. You know, our, our view uh, on nuclear is, is really how it fits in the system with the things we want to see a lot more of, like wind and solar and energy efficiency. And, uh, you know, one thing we've talked about already is flexibility and, and working well with those technologies. The other thing is cost. And simply the amount of money uh, we'd need to spend on nuclear um, would just suck everything uh, we could spend on anything else out of the room. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, Frank, thanks for the call. I know, you, I know you're a bit of a lot of, and don't have a computer. Do you want to just stay on hold and hear the show, or you got to go? Uh, no, actually, i got to head to the library. Oh, you use the public, uh, the, uh, the, uh, as Jan Michelson calls it, the, the, the welfare bookstores? It could be. Good for you. <laughs> All right, Senator Frank. I'll see you. Thanks bye. for calling. Uh, so, um, what is the timeline on this, uh, Nathaniel? The uh, the the I assume the utility board, the Iowa Utility Board, and its newest member, Swati Dandekar, uh, will have the opportunity to either approve or reject a proposal mm-hmm. or modify it in some way. Right. Yeah. Alliant announced they plan to apply to the IUB by the end of this year. This is, so this is and fast track. So it, well. I, uh, the, the application is coming soon. Uh, they didn't expect a final set of approvals until 2014. So, so. and you say they're wrapping this in with a with a broader proposal that includes getting more power from the uh, Palo Nuclear Power Plant and doing more for energy conservation. Right, right. That's what they announced. Well, what, what, we haven't seen any details on the renewable side of the energy. This, this reminds me of some of the uh, worst practices the, uh, of the Iowa legislature bundling different issues together into one bill, which actually is against the uh, it's, it's specifically forbidden in the uh, Constitution, but done anyhow. Uh, but, yeah, why shouldn't each of those components stand on its own merits? Well, the, the advantage of talking about them all together is you see how they all work together. And so they can say, we're going to build this gas plant, we're going to do, you know, uh, efficiency and renewables, and this is how it will all work. This is the, the total cost that we see. Uh, those costs can sometimes balance each other out. So well, what, what, new money spent on a power plant can be offset when consumers save money with efficiency. Um, 
So there's mm. some value in that. Uh, right. You know, we saw more detail from the natural gas plant than the rest of the proposal. Yeah. So we just, it, it's hard to evaluate the whole thing. and We need a lot more information right. on that. Uh, Nathaniel Bear, folks, has been my guest. He's with the Iowa Environmental Council. We're discussing the proposed new uh, gas-fired coal plant in Marshalltown. Up next, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, solar power with, uh, with Tim Cruzy. I'll get it right this time, folks, with a green light renewable. And uh, I want to thank all of our sponsors, the uh, Progressive Coalition of Central Iowa, the Iowa Chapter of the Sierra Club, and Physicians for Social Responsibility. We'll be back in a few minutes. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Open Sesame is Des Moines' premier Lebanese cafe. This month, Open Sesame is offering an unbeatable lunch special on Monday and Tuesdays. Mention the Fallon Forum when you order anything on Open Sesame's delicious lunch menu and get the second item for half price. That's right, buy one, get one for half price. Open Sesame's pita wrap, salad, soup, and mouth-watering Mideastern specialties will have you and your dining partner coming back again and again. Open Sesame at 313 East Locust Street in Des Moines' historic East Village. Times are tough, and most people are just trying to make their cars last a little bit longer. That's why you should know about Sargent's Garage in Des Moines. You can trust Sargent's to make the right diagnosis and give you a fair price. Whether it's a routine oil change or a major repair, Sargent's always does outstanding work. So don't give up on that old car just yet. Call Sargent's Garage at 246-8149. That's 246-8149 for Sargent's Garage. Community CPA is the 15th largest CPA firm in Iowa, providing audit, tax, and accounting services. Community CPA specializes in international tax treaty and double taxation avoidance among countries and states. Nine dedicated, experienced, hardworking staff are the company's foundation, and their compassion towards every client is the secret behind Community CPA's success. At Community CPA, you can expect quality service year-round. Call 288-3188. Community CPA, 3816 Ingersoll. Experience the difference. Well, hi, I'm Rob Spearman. I'm a broker owner of REMAX Real Estate Concepts in Des Moines, Iowa. Give us a call if you're looking at buying or selling a home, or if you're having trouble on your mortgage payments or looking to purchase foreclosures, we have the agents to help you, experienced, outstanding agents. Our office number is 515-276-2872. Or if you'd like to look at homes, go to our website, homeconnectusa.com. Hi, I'm Jay Michael McCoy, and about 20 years ago, I went to a used car salesman by the name of John Hewitt. He had a little shop over there on North 2nd Avenue called John's Auto Sales, and I bought a car. I found that experience to be one that I had never had before from a used car salesman. He was honest, he was dependable, he had integrity, and he did what he said he was going to do. Well, over the years, between my kids and grandkids, I purchased seven vehicles from John's Auto Sales. And last month, I asked him to be a sponsor. And he said not only would he like to be a sponsor, but he would offer a $100 tithe for every customer that came and bought a car from him directly to the church of your choice. I can tell you about their huge selection. I can tell you about their years of experience. I can tell you about their honest integrity. But all I really need to tell you is that I bought seven cars, and you can trust them. John's Auto sales 5435 second avenue Des Moines. you need a good ride when you hit the trail trust the man with the cars and he goes by the name of big john big john big john Is hope. Visit groundwire.net and chat now with a live coach for answers. From the Remax Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Hey, folks, uh, welcome back to the uh, conversation here. Uh, Tim Cruzy is my guest. He's with uh, Green Light Renewable. We're going to switch our conversation to uh, from uh, natural gas to uh, solar power. Uh, later in the program, uh, Barry Engerbretson with Primary Health Care will be my guest. Uh, uh, we, we're going to talk health care, of course, and um, and uh, we have quite a bit of ground to cover. So, 
Stick around for that as well. If you want to join the conversation, uh, 244-0077-244-0077 or toll-free 855-244-0077. And you can also contact me by email at fallonforum at gmail.com. Just a brief glance at uh, an item in the news that caught my attention. Um, uh, Dick Morris was in town. He's the uh, is a conservative political consultative, con- operative, hack, whatever the word is. Um, and he claimed that 100 million Americans receive welfare benefits. Um, I'm, and he says that does not include Social Security and Medicare or veterans benefits. I'm, I'm not sure what he's talking about. 100 million on welfare? I don't know what he means by that. But uh, then he goes on to say, so let's be clear about what is driving this budget deficit. Oh, talk about a bald-faced lie. I mean, yeah, you can say all sorts of things about what's driving the uh, budget deficit, but it's not, uh, it's not a handful of people on welfare and food stamps. Like, give me a break. Stop beating up on the poor. But again, a convenient target they always have been, and for some people they always will be. Um, I don't know whether this is good news or bad news, but uh, it's been reported that Congress, uh, this, this, uh, this recent Congress, the least productive since 1947. Some would say that's a good thing. Um, unfortunately, some of the things they have been productive at involve uh, expanding the war in Afghanistan, uh, increasing surveillance on American citizens through the NDAA and um, the anti-protest bill and the uh, Patriot Act. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know there's some maybe some good provisions in the health care bill and, uh, and, and a few other things you can point to, the Equal Pay Act. Um, but, you know, in terms of the deficit, you know, if we're really uh, concerned about the deficit, there was the, uh, the, uh, the Simpson-Bowles Commission. And I happen to think that there were there were there's, there was something that everybody could shoot at in that proposal. There was something everybody wouldn't like. Uh, there was stuff I didn't like, but um, it was a sincere bipartisan effort to try to move us off the dime into doing something about the deficit. Of course, Paul Ryan blocked it. He came up with his own budget, which is anything but bipartisan. And we've seen how well that's playing. Good, because I think the more people know about how horrible the now, now, let's call it the Ryan Romney path to prosperity budget is, the more people see how horrible it is. I mean, it's got to be the worst policy proposal in the history of this country. It's got to be. Uh, it's horrible. And, uh, again, if Ryan's sincere about the deficit, he had a chance. He was in a key position to do something with the Simpsons Bowl report, did nothing with it. But we're going to move beyond that. We're going to talk about something more sunny, solar power. Uh, Tim Cruzy is with me. Tim is with a business called Greenlight Renewables. Tell us about uh, your business, Tim. Well, I <clears throat> I install solar panels, design and install the systems, and I've had training for that. And part of my business is home repair, electrical work, and assisting with energy efficiency. So uh, when you say you install solar panels um, uh, on, on businesses, on homes, uh, public buildings, what uh, all the above? Homes and small business. Okay. And uh, how long have you been doing that? A couple of years. Yeah? What got you into it? Uh, I just wanted to do something good. You yeah? Know? You were doing something bad before? Well, <laughs> no, I was, just, <laughs> I'm I was just doing the regular work. Yeah. And, you know, I wanted to do something that me- meant something and, you know, help people, help the environment. And yeah. Well, it does seem to be uh, an area where there is a lot of growing interest. Um, certainly, uh, I think some of us would argue that uh, the the enthusiasm for solar should have taken off a long time ago. But uh, again, policies and the priorities in this country have been against it. Right. Uh, there are so many subsidies and incentives for oil, gas as well, um, coal, uh, and, uh, and and the limited limited amount of uh, support for wind and solar. And again, wind actually has more support, I think, than solar. Power, but uh, I think that I hope that's changing. I mean, we have places. Uh, I mean, I saw I saw a recent Facebook post about this, so you know it's true if it's on Facebook. No, I think this was actually a very reliable source, but it showed the uh, amount of solar power generated in Germany, a country that is so much cloudier. I mean, I mean, all those dark, serious Germans. Of course, they live in in, in the dark all the time. Uh, you know, they, they they but they have a lot more solar power going going on than we do. We have so much more sun here. They do, um, and I believe they have like 3.1 average or peak sun hours a day, where Iowa has 4.5. And yeah, they're doing a lot of, of a lot of solar there. And you know, I think the new state incentive is going to help us. You know, and it appears that we're starting to turn the corner. Yeah. I t- hope t- so. Tell us about that state incentive. 
Um, well, there's the 30% federal incentive that you can get on the complete cost of the system, including the installation. Is that a 30% rebate? That is a credit. Oh, tax credit. That's okay. That's a tax okay. credit. And then the new state incentive is about half of that, so 15%. So you could get 45% uh, a 45% tax credit on the installation of... Uh, Yes, but there is a limit on residential of three thousand, and then a fifteen thousand dollar limit on uh, business. Okay, so it helps. It's more inclined to help a smaller operation, a home, a small business than yes. if you were a massive entity with deep pockets and you installed this, you wouldn't have an unlimited uh, credit that you could claim. Yes, you that's good. You wouldn't be able that's to good. get your forty five percent. That makes sense. Yep, a small a small system would. And, you know, if you took a small system on a home, um, you know, and then subtracted your utility costs you wouldn't pay in the first year, you could knock about half of your costs down. Wow. Yeah, yeah. it's real helpful. So uh, now what, what can, um, let, let's take the average homeowner. What's the average homeowner? You know, it's a, a family with a $100,000, $150,000 home. Uh, again, I know there's lots of factors you know, to consider, but uh, in, in just kind of, you know, a, g a general description, what kind of money could a, a homeowner save switching to, uh, you know, installing solar panels? Um, <clears throat> depending on how you use your energy, you know, if, if you're kind of wasteful, then you'd need a bigger system. But if you're kind of conservative, you know, you could put, oh, a fifteen or twenty thousand dollar system on and knock your energy cost half to a little bit better down. So you'd spend twenty to thirty thousand installing the panels, you'd get a forty five percent if if you spend twenty or thirty thousand, you would probably knock more than half of your your energy cost out. Um, probably more like three quarters or something. Really? And um you know, the panels have a 25-year warranty on them, and they're expecting them to last 40 or 50 years. Okay. So even, wow. af even after what people consider a long payback, um, you're still going to have 20 years of free power. Yeah. Huh. Or, wow. Or, or more. Or more. Know, depending. Yeah. And again, that, and, and we also have to factor in the, the, um, the, 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 the tax credit, too. The, yeah, the tax credit. Or tax credits, federal and state. Federal and state, yeah. yes. And, and you know, your energy savings, you yeah. know, that's, that gets factored in there, too. And, and yeah. that helps bring your cost down, your initial cost. Yeah. So, I, I mean, but now, all, all, this is, all this is good, but a twenty to $30,000 investment by a homeowner is, is probably, it's a lot of money. And, and it, what, they don't even get the credit, I would imagine, until the following year, right? Um, when you go to do your taxes, right. like if you put it on this year when you went to do your taxes next year, you would be able to get it. And you can, if, if your credit is more than your taxes are, you can um, run it off to, yeah. I believe, up to 10 years. Now, do banks, credit unions, do they, do, will they provide, uh, I mean, I, I imagine you can get some of this covered through a, through a, through a loan? Yes, you yeah. can get financing on it. And some of your... Um, your distributors that sell the the PV systems, they do offer financing through the through the um, mm -hmm. distributing yeah. company. So how do you how, where do you get how did you get trained for this? Well, I went um, to the Midwest Renewable Energy Association. They're up in Wisconsin. I went there in 2010 and got my training because they really didn't have what I was looking for in Iowa. But that has changed. Really? Now they do have. Um, if you get a hold of a place in Newton, right by the Speedway, um, the name of it escapes yeah. me right now, but um, it, they ha they can get you the training out there. Newton, and, and Newton is sure becoming an energy hub with all the wind energy, and I didn't even know about the solar training. That'll help offset the carbon footprint from the Speedway. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Dan Kelly's not here to defend the Speedway today, so I can get away with that. So anyway, okay, so you can now get actually get that certification. Is it a long process? Um, Expensive process? It, it can be a little costly. Um, and you, you have to um, install so many systems before you actually qualify to take the certification exam. And, you know, the certification is good because it connects consumers with qualified mm -hmm. installers. Yeah. You know, 
And you, and you want that. You don't want some schmuck like me coming and try to put a solar panel on your house. If you see me on your roof, folks, call the police, okay? So um, how, many, how many businesses and homes do you work on a year? Well, I haven't done a lot yet. Um, a lot of my um, business has been in the home repair. Um, and the solar has improved, the interest of it has improved a lot this year. I think the new state incentive has really gotten a lot of interest. Good. Because I've had a lot more calls lately. Now, is there a cap on that? The state uh, tax credit? Often there is. Yeah, 3000 for residential. But I mean, a total cap in terms of what the state will spend. Um, yes, there is. I think. Because I know when the state put a, when we established, I was at, I was there at the time when we established the historic tax credit, mm -hmm. and uh, we capped that I think at 2.4, 2.5 million, snapped up like that. There was no, they, they, they were hardly even authorized before they were all snapped up, and then there, and then there was a 17 year waiting list. Oh my! So they had to go in and, and reauthorize the the, 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 the challenge then was to try to expand the uh, the cap so that you know more more businesses and homes could qualify. Right. We don't have that problem yet with this tax credit. There is a cap on it, and I can't remember. I can't remember if it's five million yeah. comes to mind, but no, but if it's high enough I to could, work with, I then yeah, off there. But um, you know, every little bit helps. Yeah. You know, we we do need to do it, and and. I think it's a good thing. Yeah. Now, do you travel the state? Are you mostly working in the Des Moines area? I would work pretty much anywhere in Iowa. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, the uh, and, and again, I, I, I think um, I, I hope more and more people take advantage of this because, uh, I mean, we've got to move. You know, we just heard a conversation about gas. Sure, better than coal, but, ugh, what, you know, the more we can do to move toward uh, renewables, uh, the better. I mean, we are in a rough spot uh, as a planet right now. We're in a rough spot economically. Uh, we see other people around the country, other nations around the, around the world, rather, that are moving really fast in some of these renewable technologies, even cloudy Germany, for example, and even cloudier Denmark. I mean, they're doing good things with this technology. Yes. And it's exciting to see you uh, and other young and middle-aged, if I might say, entrepreneurs uh, taking off with this sort of thing. Um, so, uh, you know, it's it's um, if people wanted to get in touch with you, it's, what's the best way to do that? Well, my um, website is greenlightrenew.com. Greenlight, greenlightrenew.com. And my email is greenlightrenew at mail.com. Okay. Yeah. And, and do, you, do you help people with uh, more passive solar stuff as well? Um. I could. I haven't had a lot of interest in that, um, but I could. And you know, I, like I said, I would be happy to help with to make their homes more energy efficient. Because you know, every bit you, you do with making your home more energy efficient, yeah. you're going to save in your utility bills. We threw the uh, we threw your email address up on the um, or your website rather up there on the uh, on the screen. Uh, phone number two if. Folks want to contact you by phone? 515 250 4268. 250 4268. 4268. 4268. A little mix up there. 4268. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Tim, for joining us, and good luck with that. I think it's incredibly important to have more people in your line of work. So thanks for uh, thanks for deciding to do something good. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for having All me right. on. Uh, folks, we'll be back in a few minutes. I want to take a th second to thank uh, some of our other local uh, business supporters. Again, uh, this show is all about local. It's local conversation with mostly local. We bring in some interesting people from around the country once in a while, but we've got a lot of great talent right here in central Iowa, and we've got a lot of great local businesses that believe in providing an alternative to the crazy talk on uh, right-wing radio. So, again, let me thank um, let me thank uh, Reynolds Energy Solutions. Maybe you even know Tim Reynolds. Uh, Tim does uh, energy audits. He, um, he can probably, uh, t t Tim can tell you where your energy is being wasted. He can probably tell you where you might benefit from a solar panel or two as well. But uh, I had Tim come in and do an energy audit at my place. And uh, uh, again, in the end, because of the rebate, it will cost you nothing. And he will tell you all sorts of things you can do to save energy and save money. So contact uh, Tim at ReynoldsEnergySolutions.com. I also want to thank Gateway Market. Gateway is one of a handful of uh, locally owned natural and organic food stores that have... Um, 
and serving the community without the benefit of government subsidies uh, and without sending their money to some corporate headquarters elsewhere. So uh, check out Gateway Market at Woodland and ML King in the Sherman Hill neighborhood. I think you'll like what you find. I um, I. I love Gateway because it's uh, it's in a, in a neighborhood that I can I can pack up my bike bags uh, full of goodies and just haul them home without even having to drive there. So uh, check them out, folks. At, uh, Woodland and ML King. That's Gateway Market. We'll be back in a few minutes on the Fallon Forum. From the Remax Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. <laughs> Well, good morning. This is the 7th of June in the Lord's year 2010, and this is day uno, one, of webcast1live.com. We will begin with Max World Live with my special guest, Tom Coates, in just a minute. There's Tom. Wait. Howdy. And uh, we will be live for the very first time on Webcast One Live. We're going to look back on this and say, gosh, remember that old day in history? Wonder where Walter Cronkite was. He must have been around hanging there, too. But actually, it's the beginning of Webcast One Live. And thank you for listening. Thanks, Rob Spearman and everybody who's put together this project together. And uh, we're ready to go live now. So thanks for listening to MaxWorldLive.com. I can't tell you that it's going real well from time to time, but it is going. If your computer's not running up to speed, don't waste any time with 1-800 numbers. Call your local professional at Mid-Iowa Computers. Known for excellent customer service, they can help you with all your computer needs, including 100% electronic malware removal. If you've just had enough of your computer or other electronic device, bring it in to Mid-Iowa Computers, and they'll recycle it for free. For more information, visit MidIowaComputers.com or call 515-210-8536 and get your computer fixed by someone you can trust. Nestled in the heart of downtown, Ritual Cafe is one of Des Moines' most unique places, offering a wide variety of coffee and tea. Ritual Cafe also serves the only all-vegetarian menu in town. And Ritual Cafe is a cultural hub for artists and musicians, with a performance stage hosting local, national, and international talent. Make Ritual Cafe a part of your daily ritual on 13th Street between Locust and Grand in downtown Des Moines. And check out RitualCafe.com. With warm weather finally here, it's time to think about upgrading the efficiency of your furnace and air conditioner. Leonard Tinker Heating and Cooling has provided honest, competent service for over 20 years. Whether it's your home or business, for repair work or to install a more energy-efficient furnace or air conditioner, call Leonard Tinker at 263-0422. That's 263-0422. For honest, competent heating and cooling service, call Leonard Tinker at 263-0422. Ludwig von Beethoven here. I used to be so, so tired all the time, not from composing and playing, but from moving my piano. But now I feel so much better. I call S&P Piano, and they will bring my piano anywhere. They also sell and rent pianos, used ones, new ones. You get the idea. Call S&P Piano right away at 208-6453. That's 208-6453. S&P Piano. From the Remax Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. All right, to the uh, to the uh, free market types out there, and I would consider myself a, a free market type. How do you justify? The state continuing to give handouts to companies like a New Jersey pharmaceutical company, four hundred grand in tax incentives. Um, yeah, uh, how about um, a uh, a um, 
a firearm supplier. Uh, they want um, 1.1 million in tax credits and a 1.4 million dollar grant <laughs> from the taxpayers for. I, I, I just and then you've got then you've got a a, um, a company named Rus Rusalat. I don't know whether maybe they're from France. Uh, they produce gelatin. They want $150,000 sales tax break. Um, and then there's Outcomes, Inc. It's a medication management company. I don't even know what that means, medication management. Maybe you do. Uh, they want um, $150,000 from the taxpayers to create 20 jobs. You know, I'm, I'm still waiting for Governor Branstad to throw the Fallon form a little tax break. Uh, you know, again, I could, I, could, I could use some help. We could create some jobs. I, I won't even ask for that much. And I promise you I will not move the Fallon form to Mexico, Southeast Asia, or some other third world country. Um, still trying to sort out how we can justify that sort of behavior while cutting the uh, food bank uh, appropriation and requiring um, uh, people who want food stamps to uh, have to take a drug test or do a criminal background check. Are we doing any drug testing for the uh, CEOs of these companies? I doubt it. Anyway, on to other things. <laughs> Good morning. Barry, welcome to the show. Barry Angerbretson is back with us again, folks. Um, and his cell phone just went off, but he's about to uh, <laughs> turn it off. Turn it off. There you go. <laughs> uh, and you're welcome to join this conversation at 244-0077, uh, Toll free, it's 855 244 Seven seven. Uh, uh, Barry, we were talking last week about um, about mental health issues, and um, well, there, there's a, we, it was kind of a starting point. Uh, where would where would you like to go from here? Well, we were talking about uh, somewhat of a new approach, uh, at least in sort of widespread uses usage to mental health and behavioral health services. It titled uh, it's called um, integrated primary care mental health or integrated primary care behavioral health services, where the provider of behavioral health services is actually an integral part of the primary care medical team, as opposed to being located in an office somewhere else where uh, you have to make a separate appointment, come yeah. back on a separate day, a separate time. I mean, that makes a lot of sense in, to me in terms of the client um I mean, it just it, it's it's more hassle free to go one place and get the services you need. It also seems like it would be a friendlier arrangement for the taxpayer. Well, you can certainly cut down on a lot of the costs in terms of uh, staff time to duplicate appointments, um, duplicate scheduling, all of this kind of stuff. Um, and the idea is that many times with with and, we, and I guess I should back up and say we use the term behavioral health to encompass both what we all know of as mental health issues, right, uh, depression, sure. anxiety, and, and more serious illness, as well as the broader behavioral problems that have to do with health. And in that category, there's kind of a, a catch-all of things that have to do with um, uh, nutrition, exercise, um, some use and or I thought I turned that off. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it must not have caught. Okay, sorry. Um, exercise, stress reduction, all of the things that affect a person's general health um, by their ability to manage their own health in the 99.9 percent of the time that they're not in a health professional's office. Yeah. So um, th there was a there was quite a debate this year at the state house regarding trying to. Um, Kind of uh, revamp the delivery of mental health care because of the uh, discrepancies. You got you got some counties where uh, county government is doing a pretty good job at providing the uh, necessary services, and other counties where it wasn't happening. And is, is this related to that initiative at all? Well, it, the concept of uh, integrating the medical care and the mental health care was discussed uh, in the deliberations and, and is in the report actually that encouraging the integration of these services. The focus in the first year was primarily on what you described this mm -hmm. whole, and a lot of it had to do with the finances of how the financing of the mental health system would be, or the public financing would be distributed. So it didn't get a lot into sort of those details of how it actually would work. But I'm assuming that as we go forward, this will become more a part of the conversation. Yeah. Now, you'd, you'd mentioned uh, earlier a, a term I had not heard of before, the, uh, the uh, quote, warm handoff. Right. Uh, I've not heard of that term. Um, 
I, I mean, maybe uh, I've, heard, I've heard of it in re applied to relay races, but um, <laughs> not in, uh, in <laughs> not, right. not in terms of uh, medical care. So what, right. what, what is what is that uh, referencing? Well, the, the warm handoff is how the transfer of the care process goes between the primary care medical provider and the behavioral health provider. As I mentioned, most commonly, that occurs by way of a referral, where a, a separate re appointment is made often on a different date, often at a different place, although it can be at the same place. In this case, the handoff occurs at the time of the primary care visit, and it can occur either before the visit or immediately after the visit. That's where the term warm handoff mm -hmm. okay. um, comes from. And the, the after the visit most commonly would occur when the primary care medical provider uncovers a behavioral or mental health issue that they would like some help on. The uh, prior to the visit handoff can occur if the patient's already known to the practice and perhaps yeah. there's been something going on that the behavioral health staff already are aware of uh, that they could step in actually before my visit with the patient and maybe begin to address some of the issues or follow up on issues from before. A lot of this happens um, by what another team, another, I guess, team sports uh, terminology, which is by way of a huddle, which actually occurs first thing in the morning in our case, or it can occur twice a day morning and, and afternoon schedule, where everybody sits down together and actually looks at who's coming in that day, what their issues are, what things need to be addressed. So, so at, at each of the primary health care clinics, the staff, the medical staff, will, will uh, look at the schedule and and uh, the roster, so to speak, if we can use another sports metaphor, right. and decide uh, if there are areas in where, which they can be uh, uh, coordinating efforts. T to be honest, we've been piloting this at one side, and we are just now uh, at the beginning of beginning hiring additional staff to move it to our other four but sites. It, apparently it's working well. We feel it's working yeah. well at the one site where we've been piloting it, and I think our our clinical staff there is very enthusiastic and are sort of acting as salespersons, if you will, for the other sites that may have questions, because it is a change, and yeah. all change but is hard. Is, is, it, is, it, um, is maybe the resistance that, uh, that, that it re I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe people just don't like to meet that early in the morning before coffee? Um. Well, that ac well, actually, <laughs> that's been one of the issues, is when do we do it? And what we did at our site was actually cancel the first appointment of the day, or, or actually would block it out and be a more sure. appropriate term, yeah. so that we can use that first 15 minutes of the day to do that. Now, some people say, well, that cuts out, you know, X number of visits over the size of your staff over the period of a week or month or year, which is technically true, but most people feel that you actually save time in the yeah. course of the day. In another example, not related to integrated mental health, um, is, you know, maybe somebody needs their labs followed up on. We ordered the lab, the report's not available, or doesn't appear to be in the chart. So they can actually make a phone call or try and track down that lab before I actually get in to see the patient and mm. discover, oh, the lab's missing. Oh. So it can occur ahead of time. So there's other advantages beyond the integrated yeah. behavioral mental health in terms so of it's, it seems it seems to make sense, uh, but again, yeah. and change is always, uh, comes with change, challenges. Change so. is hard. Um, yeah, so uh, we, are there any, um, I mean, what, what do you see the? I mean, where do you where do you see this um, this going in terms of uh, next year's uh, legislative session? I mean, I know we've still, in terms of the political environment, people are still looking at what happens at the uh, presidential election this fall. That the uh, in terms of control of the state house and, uh, you know, I think mental health. There are some elements of it that have been partisan. We've had more a more friendly response from Democratic lawmakers, but in you know on in some in some areas you'll get you'll get some good bipartisan cooperation. So maybe it's too early, though, to tell what the uh, climate might be at the state house. but, you know, any, have you, have you done any thinking about what might happen relevant to these concerns at the uh, Capitol next year? Um, we probably haven't thought too much ahead to the next session. Um, last year, I actually did present on this to one of the subcommittees to try to at least get it into the, the language, and not the legislative language, but the common language of people discussing what did mental you, health. What did you present to them? About integrated health care okay. and integrated behavioral health care and what, yeah. we're trying to, yeah. what we're trying to do. Uh, so it was just a beginning. And, and, um, but I think th there's actually a growing national momentum but behind this kind of care. Um, the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration has this on their agenda 
at a high level, and HRSA, Health Resources Services Administration, that funds a lot of our programs, also has it highly on their agenda. And, you know, the good news is they've actually been working together. Sometimes the, mm-hmm. the silos within the federal government uh, don't always necessarily well, I, I work think any, closely it, together. Anytime you get collaboration, cooperation, it's, it's got to be a good thing. I mean, it just has I to agree. be. I, I, um, I was on the uh, Human Services Committee for uh, several years when I was a, a state, state House member. And the, um, the, a program that really captured my attention was uh, called the Patch Program. It's a, it was a program started and, and operated in Great Britain where uh, somebody coming in for one or more elements of uh, public service, whether it was food stamps or, or, or you know, child care assistance or, or, or welfare, um, instead of going to multiple, uh, multiple points of entry, there was one point of entry. And there was one place in Iowa, there was no requirement by the uh, DHS to implement such a program statewide, but there was one place in Cedar Rapids that did it on its own, and it was called the Brownstone, and the idea was to put this um, put this uh, collaborative effort in the neighborhood. This was in the Wellington Heights neighborhood of Cedar Rapids, in a building. It was a brownstone building, thus the name. Uh, but you would go there, and you would access all, uh, you know, you would access the full range of services available in one place. I, I, I thought it, it, it was much more client friendly. I, I can't help but imagine that it was also uh, more friendly to the taxpayers. You know, and the one place where I saw a, a significant um, uh, movement in the other direction. I, I mean, I mean, I, I know that you could go places where you'd have to go. You know, in, in some circumstances, you'd go to multiple places for for program access. But it was one place um, in in the uh, in, in the um, service delivery area in Des Moines that required you to go to two workers. Uh, this is interesting to me, and and you'll and you'll recognize the name when I tell you who operated that program. Ramona Cunningham with CTEC. <laughs> Uh, I, I was starting to, <laughs> I was kind of onto her a little bit early. She basically created a situation where you had two points of entry. I mean, and it wasn't it wasn't optional. You went to one worker for this set of programs, another worker for this set, thus basically creating a three hundred and fifty thousand dollar waste, an additional taxpayer you know payment that uh, that well uh, allowed her to afford expensive vacations, I guess. But um, I bring that up anecdotally because. Uh, you know that's an ex- and I'm not saying that anyone else is doing that. That was an extreme example of corruption, um, and we're not talking about corruption in this case. We're talking about efficiency and about um, making the services more friendly for the client. But I think that's what the patch program and the brownstone program were able to do. And and I've actually been attending uh, integrated primary care mental health meetings for probably two decades, and and it's just now sort of starting to become. Uh, part of the conversation in a realistic way. I think what you're addressing is a very deeply systemic problem within, and I'm just going to talk about healthcare, or maybe I could broaden it out to human services. And it's an outgrowth, I feel, of our very specialized, Mm -hmm. highly technical approach to everything. And we sort of, we admire and appreciate the the technology and the specialized expertise that's needed the problem is that it's, what this has created is a whole um, group of entities that are advocates for their highly specialized kind of integra- um, uh, access to services and, and highly specialized delivery of services. Uh, it's, and, the, and so there's, they all have their own rules. They all have right. their own eligibility requirements. They all have their own funding streams. And you get to charge more when you're a specialist. Well, that's true too. <laughs> that, but but you know, right. it's it's the if you will the advocacy or lobbying behind each of these specialized programs that sort of allows that to happen within the the federal bureaucracy. So all these different programs are created uh, side by side, mm-hmm. you know. And if if the funding were centralized, and this is you know, there's also the DCAT, or DCAT programs that have been around yeah. for a long time. And they've always run up against the, the turf issues, the territorial mm-hmm. problems. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and often it means you've got people with very strong vested interests that are running these programs that, that feel threatened sure. by, you know, the, the literal it's decategorization. That's yeah, a job security it's, thing. Exactly. Yeah. And so it's, it's very tough. And I, you know, I, I have to give credit to those that, 
you know, at the national level yeah. that are trying to make more sense out of this. Well, uh, Barry, I sure appreciate you having me on the uh, having you on the program, and I know folks uh, will benefit from this information. Uh, Barry Engerbretson with uh, Primary Healthcare, and you can um, you can contact Primary Healthcare online. PHCINC.net. PHCINC.net. And also the phone, probably the easiest phone number in Des Moines is 248-1500. 248-1500. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll look forward to having you back sometime soon. Uh, I'm thinking lunchtime, folks, uh, about now for me, and I'm thinking Proof Restaurant at 13th and Locust. Again, lunch there is fantastic, but you got to check out the Thursday and Friday evening supper as well. Every Thursday and Friday now they're open, again, under new ownership with some incredible chefs that, uh, that have taken creativity to a new level, so much so that I had somebody report back to me about the uh, second Saturday supper that Proof does, that it was the best dining experience they have had in Des Moines. Anyway, folks, uh, stay tuned for Bradshaw at 1.30. And I want to thank Webcast One Live for uh, hosting this program. And my producer, Maddie Arrington, will be back Monday on the Fallon Forum. I'm Brian Leach, owner and general manager of Service Legends. Oh, I brought uh, along a couple of the uh, home comfort heroes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tammy Wells. I am Nick Wondershot. I'm administrative manager. I'm the senior technician. From Service Legends. It seems like every good thing, when you feel it to the bone that it's good, there's a lot of hard work put behind it. You just, I, I don't think that you can fake it and have it turn out good. You know, if we seem like, okay, that's just weird, it's just a furnace, why would you believe so deeply in a furnace? It's not just that, you know, we want to show the world that you can have good service. Yeah, I mean, it's gotta be, it's your home. You know, it's, it's built into our daily trainings, it's built into our culture, um, that we're gonna do whatever it takes to have each client say they love us, period. That's why we spend all the hours in the training that we do. And if we guarantee it's gonna be a good experience for you, or else it's free, what type of work do you think we're gonna do? <laughs> there is a guarantee. Temperature selection guarantee, fixed rider it's free guarantee, comfort guarantee, best value guarantee, all of these guarantees 